Are we rolling? We're rolling a recorder. My name is David Noreen. I'll be conducting the interview today of Olive Clark. Today is September 17th, 2007. We're in Studio X of Campbell Hall in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, assisting on lighting, sound, and video is Henry M. Radcliffe III, and we'll be talking about the American home front during the war. Okay, Olive, could you tell us, just for the record, uh, your date of birth? I was born July 27, 1920. Okay, and would you care to tell us your story then? Uh, about my war story? Yes. Um, well, my husband called up one d day and he said, I'm coming home Thursday. We're going to get married. And so we did. And he went back to Texas and I stayed at home. And then he came back for, on another furlough and um, I went with him back to Childress, Texas. Okay, and this would have been what, what year? When 19, you fill me in. I guess it was a year after the war started. Okay, so this would have been 1942 then. 42, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you went and, to Texas. Pardon? You went to Texas then. Yes, to Childress, Texas. And it was like stepping back into another century because they were still deep in the Depression there. And the things in the window were all dusty. You could see nobody bought them. And it was a very small town, even though it was a uh, county seat. And Childress, and, Texas is where the Air Force Base was. Yeah, and then the Air Force Base came. It was a good place to have an Air Force Base. And my husband um, taught Northern Bomb Site and um, automatic pilot to the lieutenants who were flying. And the name of your husband then is George. I ought to put a name on him, shouldn't I? Um, so it was quite boring down there, so I looked for a job, and I thought maybe I could get a civil service job at the base. So they gave me an old typewriter, pretty junky thing. They didn't give me a desk or a chair, but they put the <laughs> typewriter on a shelf. You know, it was about that high, and uh, gave me the test. Well, it was inevitable that was going to fail. You weren't used to typing at that level. <laughs> no. Okay. And I had been to the best secretarial school in New York City, and I knew how to type. So I gave that thought up, and a friend of mine that I had made in Childress said there was an opening to be secretary to the city manager of Childress. So that's how I got earning some money because we only had $50 to work with for our room and for our food. And so we had to eat out every night. And um, it was kind of meager. And I So found was that money, that was the combined? No. That was that's why I had to get a job. Uh -huh. So we could eat uh, chili for supper, and then later on, then I could have lunch <laughs> with the money that I, we made. Yeah. So it wasn't too easy. And the rooms that we rented that were just beds and a dresser, that was it. Okay, so there wasn't housing on the base at that time. Uh, you lived it, off the base. If it were, I don't remember okay. so. And it may have been just for the officers. I see. Probably was. And your husband, George, had what rank at this time? He was, went in as a private. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, people were very friendly and nice. And if they had a pic picnic, they'd always invite us. And the churches always supplied a Sunday. Um, whatever, um, after church service. So we went to a lot of churches. Each Sunday there were, an, as another church had a um, lunch for the soldiers. Mm. 
Did your husband like his job teaching uh, the Norden bombs? Yeah, and, well, and you don't have much choice when <laughs> you're in the service. He, he didn't dislike it, but, uh, you know, you don't like war. And it was soon after that that he was transferred to Langley, Langley Field in Virginia. And I left in tears. And because by that time you you'd gotten used to Texas. Yeah, sure, gotten used to the place. Mm -hmm. And um, left in tears, and we packed our car after about eight o'clock at night. And you want me to tell you about our incident along the yes, way? Yes, we'd like to hear it. And um, the generator in our car gave out. We couldn't see for anything. All you could see were jackrabbits. It was dark, and I mean dark. I've never seen anything so dark. And, and when where, the were the, where were this? This was in route from Texas to Virginia. Yeah. It was somewhere. No, like not Virginia. We were going home. We, he had a week's furlough. Oh. Um, we were going home to New Jersey, and uh, this man in the truck came along. He says, can I help you? And he fig fiddled around with the engine or whatever it was, and he said, I think you'll better just follow me, use my headlights to guide you into town. Well, town wasn't just down the road five miles, it was a little trip. We found a man who was still working at about 11 o'clock at night. And so we stopped him and told him our problem and he said he could fix it. And um, it would take a couple of hours and then at uh, two o'clock in the morning, we were on our way again. I don't know whether it was a blessing or not to have that happen because um, it put us back in time, um, you know, that we didn't have anymore. And um, so we just drove and drove and drove. And then one morning, uh, it's five o'clock in the morning, and we were in Indiana going up just a gradual slope and uh, a big truck was in front of us covered with snow and at five o'clock everything looked snowy and my husband uh, no the truck driver downshifted so uh, he plowed into the back of that truck just swerving in time to get under the truck mm -hmm. the truck man didn't even know that we had hit him and he kept driving and driving, and uh, my husband had to honk the horn. Well, he called the state police, and then I was taken to the hospital because I had a concussion. And I was put in the maternity ward because <laughs> that was the only bed available, and the Red Cross really came to our help. They packed up all our things, shipped them back to New Jersey, and flagged down the train so that I could have a sleeping berth going home. My parents met me then. And then that he headed on to Langley after his uh, time at home. And so you both uh, grew up in New Jersey then? Yes, yeah. And um, he went on to Langley and I recovered from my concussion and I had to go take the train from Newark down to the tip of New Jersey. If you're familiar with the map, you know, it comes down to a little spot. Get on this uh, ferry boat, and I'm sure it was a ferry boat, cross the Chesapeake Bay. And we were told that we were going to go through the submarine net area and it was dangerous, and it would take all night long, and it did. But we didn't get there until the next morning. Now, this is because at that time there were uh, German submarines uh, there, yeah. along the East Coast, yeah. and so this was netting that was set up to try to uh, protect uh, the river area and upstream yeah. from the submarines. That's right. Uh, today they've made quite an improvement. There's the Chesapeake Bay Tunnel Bridge, and you're going down to the tunnel, and then you come up, and you ride across on a bridge. And you can't see land from that area. We've traveled it. 
Well, when we got there, then we went and found a place to live, to sleep. Well, and if I could just go back a minute, you say you took the ferry across, but because of the submarine netting, uh, it had to go around certain areas. I, they had, it, yeah, a real they detour. had, yeah. You could see. And so, how um, long did it take? All night long. Hmm. And the soldiers, everywhere you went, the soldiers had to stand if there weren't a seat. And uh, in this case, there weren't a, there wasn't a seat for all of them. And when one soldier moved over like this, and I could sit there, and he let me sleep on his shoulder. Pretty soon, I think he was sleeping on me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that, but he had to be because it was all night long. And where did we leave off? Oh, then I got it. We had a place to sleep, and it was so cold because they didn't have central heating. Now, where was this? That was in Newport News, Virginia. Okay. Mm. And the people there were very nice. Um, they could let me keep some milk in the refrigerator, and I could have breakfast with cereal and stuff. And then I got a job with... Um, was this something that the Red Cross had helped you set up when they helped you set up the... Uh, or they was... packed, uh, packed all our things from the car because it was totaled. Mm -hmm. And... Um, then they stopped the train so we could get home. Mm -hmm. So uh, and they helped you to find the place there that you stayed, or you just found that on your own, or oh yeah, I think my husband had found it before he I see before he knew I was coming down. And um, so I went to work for the UFO, and that was kind of fun. I made him. And this was near Langley. Uh, base yeah. in Virginia? Yeah, I don't know whether it was on base or in the city. I really don't remember And this is what how later I got became there. The, the CIA, Pardon? right? This, the Langley base later became the CIA? Yes. Okay. It probably was then, too, because everything was secret. Mm -hmm. Everything was secret. They'd bring in a plane and cover it over with white covering. Camouflage yeah. type netting, probably. Yeah. And they allowed us to see the wind tunnels and a couple of other things that you knew, you know, were really secret. Mm -hmm. mm. So I worked for the USO and I made ham salad sandwiches. I haven't made a ham salad sandwich <laughs> since. But I don't know how I made it. It must have been spam. I don't know. <laughs> I've been trying to recall how it was made. But I did that, and um, we served the soldiers coffee and cookies and ice cream, things like that. And at night, they'd have dances for the soldiers. So I just worked there, say, like from 9 to 5, and then I'd stay in the evening and dance with them, or my husband, probably wasn't, mostly my husband, but you got to know a lot of people too, mm -hmm. that way. And so then I decided, well, I'd take a uh, civil service examination again, and this time I passed, they must have needed somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got to work on the base, and I worked for uh, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which is now NASA. Okay. And um, so that impressed my grandson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and what sort of things did you do for them? Well, it was secretarial work. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much about the job uh, because I was pregnant and it was quite difficult staying awake. Um, I wasn't pregnant when I got the job, but afterwards I was. And um, so then I had to go home. I was told by the doctor I had to go home before four months were up. And later I had a baby girl, Susan. And she's here with us today. And she still is. <laughs> Well, I'm with her, really, because I moved here from the East Coast. And um, 
And what else was I going to say? Um, he didn't get home until she was talking and walking. It seemed like after the war was declared, you'd expect to get a letter that your husband was coming home, but it seemed like forever, ever, and ever. So when you were in Texas, uh, you were both stateside, but then at Langley, he was there at the beginning, and then he was assigned overseas. Yes, he went overseas to uh, Guam and Saipan. And that's when they were sitting out in the field, and they'd look around like this and see a Jap sitting next to them as they were watching a movie at night. I don't know whether they came down from the hills or out from the swamp or where, but uh, they were there. I can't think of anything else at the moment to tell you. So there were regular movie showings that yeah. were just supposed to be for the, the troops, but yeah. they had a few yeah. mm -hmm. extra guests there that yeah. <laughs> snuck in. Yeah. Mm. Now, how about your experiences of the the home front during the war, the the rationing and yeah, and that's the what I was thinking about too, uh, as I was talking with some of my friends. Uh, gasoline was rationed, and it must have been that all my friends kicked in and gave me some ration cards, or tickets, or stubs, or whatever you had to have for gasoline in order to make your trip from in order to Texas get home. To yeah. And um, we were rationed for butter and meat. And whenever meat was on sale, everybody told everybody else. So we would get to the grocery store pretty quickly and get it, get our meat. Um, I think shoes were rationed too at one time, now that I think about it. At the time, you really don't think much about it. Either you're too young and you don't think of the seriousness of all this. I have friends at Clark Lindsay, and they're, they were, they're come from Germany, and the hardships they felt during the war was just terrible, terrible. Mm -hmm. So we weren't, I wasn't what you would call uncomfortable mm -hmm. but it wasn't like home because as I say they were very still very poor not to have central heating oh another thing uh, it never rained in Texas and they had beds outside because it was so hot and we would sleep out under the stars that was kind of fun and you'd see the shooting stars all over the place <laughs> it, it was uh, something we remember Mm. Now, there's a lot of recycling going on in those years with scrap metal and newspapers. No, they didn't do they that. They didn't do that no. in Texas. Not at all. Not at all. Now, did you hear often from your husband by letters? Uh, was that uh, possible oh, to yeah. communicate when he, back and forth? When he went overseas, he sent me a letter. I would write every day, too. And you wouldn't get a letter for maybe four or five days, and then, then you'd get a couple. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. And it seems like it was all getting through. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, of course, like at Guam, you couldn't put it, pick up the mail. I'm sure you couldn't every day. I think that's about it, as far as I can remember, unless you can jog my memory on something. Well, what about your, your husband's service? Uh, what, did, what was he doing overseas uh, in those locations? What was he? It was still the Norden bomb site mm -hmm. and um, instructional mm -hmm. activities there. And he, if a plane was damaged, he'd try to repair some of it and send it back out. Because I remember him saying that. Uh, they just sat outside and waited for their plane to return. Mm. And so he had some spare time there where he could use some of his yes. skills yeah. that he has. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Maybe you mm. could tell us about what he made for you. Oh, he made some wooden boxes. I uh, know it's a very hard wood 
I forget the name of it. It's not teak, or could it be teak? And he made jewelry out of shells. I guess all the soldiers did because there were an awful lot of, of these uh, shells when, when he came home. And then coming back home, finding a job and a place to live was very, very difficult. And where did you end up settling then? Well, in the next town, his mother and father lived, and they had a two-family house. This was in New Jersey then? Yeah, right in Passaic, New Jersey, and I lived in Clifton. The town sort of joined. And uh, we they gave us the flat upstairs after they put their tenant out. And then pretty soon we had our own home. By then, I hope everything was settled. <laughs> mm. So during the the war, the two places that you lived were Texas and and then near Langley. Yeah, base. Newport there, News, they call it. Okay, it was just those two places. Then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm. And how did you like uh, the Newport News? You, you said you you got used to Texas and you you liked it. Yeah. And how about Newport News? Uh, is that um, an interesting place to live too? They were very much um, against the blacks. I was walking along the street and somebody called over, don't you see a white woman there? So he had to get out in the road so that I could walk by the sidewalk. The black man wasn't allowed to walk on the sidewalk when yeah. a white woman was walking yeah. on a sidewalk. Yeah, not the same time space that I was in. I see. Mm. But to tell you how poor Childress, Texas was, you had a home here and you wanted your road paved. All the roads were unpaved. So you wanted yours paid, paved, so they would pave just in front of your house. So you'd be riding on pavement one minute and then if the next door neighbor didn't uh, want to spend the money to pave the road, you would ride on dirt. And mud in Texas is like no other place. Your shoes stick. When you <laughs> but that's the way the streets looked. Half paved, not, not paved. Of course, as I say, we only had one room and um, something to heat some water. And about that time, they had instant coffee come out. And so we could make coffee for ourselves. But it wasn't much. Can you think of anything else? Well, in Texas, did the did people live kind of all over the town who worked on the base, or did they kind of tend to live in the same sort of area? Did you socialize with? Uh... Yeah, my husband had a friend we socialized with, and they had a baby, and the baby just came along too. So we kind of, you know, just loved that child. Mm. There were different things we could do. Oh, another thing, in Childress, um, everybody goes to the town on Saturday night, and you park your car at an angle. But what they did was go down and put their garbage can there so that nobody else could take the spot. To reserve it. You've heard of that being No, I, I haven't. But. Yeah. And so, um, it, <laughs> you know, we didn't know that trick, and we didn't have a garbage can anyway. But we had to park a little bit out of town to get into town, so we'd go to the movies. And so is this a particular store that would reserve its spots for people, or it was no. it was people from the town that would take their garbage can all the way downtown just to yeah. reserve the spot? Yeah, that's what they did. Hmm. Yeah, and they just came really down to visit, and they'd sit on the bumper of their car or the front on the radiator by the radiator and um, meet friends and just catch up with what was going on. I had never seen that done before either. But the, and the sidewalks were wooden because of the mud. And you had to walk up two stairs, two steps I should say, to get on the sidewalk because of the mud. It sounds almost like the westerns that you see yes. in the movie where they yeah. have the, the yeah. wooden sidewalks. Yeah. Mm. 
Well, as I say, I can't think of anything else. So the town was mostly the base, uh, and then, I mean, the base was like half the people of the town, or how? Um, I, I don't know um, about that so much, but there were a lot of soldiers that had to rent rooms. Mm -hmm. If they were on the base, they were not married. But the married people did, they came off. And from, I was going to say the buses were like school buses, too. They had a ride from Oklahoma to a children's on like a school bus. Now, did the town have other things like a movie theater or a place for Just dancing? Just the one theater. The one that theater. was all it had. I'd be surprised if there were a thousand people in that town. Oh, okay, that's what yeah. I was wondering about. They had two grocery stores. That was it. Mm. I wonder if you could tell us some more about the USO in, in Virginia. Um. Well, my memory isn't too good on that, except that um, I did spend some time there. Um, and as I told you, we served them food. They had to pay a minimum price. It wasn't very much. And it was a place for the soldiers just to hang around and on their day off or whatever. But they would come in at night. And I don't think it was on, on the base. I don't know. I don't remember that either. But you had records then, a record player for the dancing? Oh, yeah, yeah, mm hmm yeah. Well, can you think of anything else I can tell you uh, from my notes? It's, uh, I think you've covered most of what you've uh, I think told me about. Yeah. I guess that's it. What kind of music do you remember most? Who is that? Susan was wondering if you remembered what kind of music uh, you liked uh, dancing to back at that time. Oh, you know, the good old time. Big Sammy. band music, the swing yeah. music. Yeah. Glenn Miller. And mm -hmm. Well, okay, thank you. <laughs> I should have told you that too. <laughs> <laughs> Your story, you know, whatever you want to say. I'm not going to censor things. I'm not, you know, I'm just there to kind of help bring it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So you can always say, you know, you can email people and say, you know, here's my story, and, you know, and then you can add postscripts that you want, and you just put in the, the link. And they can just click on the link and they'll go right to